Today, liquidity, please. The property imperative daily for the 13th of March 2020. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Given the current market gyrations, we're going to examine the latest critical data each day because a week is a long time in politics, but a lifetime on the market at the moment. And I think that Friday the 13th of March 2020 will be long remembered. So the local market, having spent most of the time in the red, pulled out a miracle towards the end of the day, and that was in response to the Reserve Bank's injection of 8.8 billion into the short term markets. The ASX 100 closed up 4.54% to 4,602. The Financial Services Index was up 3.73% to 4,720. And the Volatility Index was up 84.23% to 4223. Amongst the major banks, ANZ was down 1.83% to 1824. CBA was up 0.3% to 6441. NAB was down 3.27% to 1787. And Westpac was down 233 to 1762. Westpac confirmed that it had been hit with another class action relating to the Oztrack scandal. The class action was brought by Johnson, Winter and Slattery, and it's been filed on behalf of certain shareholders who acquired interests in Westpac securities or equity swaps between 2013 and 2019. The claim relates to market disclosure issues connected to Westpac's monitoring of financial crime over the relevant period and matters, of course, that are subject to the Austrac proceedings. And Westpac said they would be defending the claim. The Bank of Queensland was down 1.18% to 584. Bendigo and Adelaide Bank was up 0.77% to 655. Suncorp was down 2.69% to 939. And Macquarie was down 0.73% to 112.90. AMP was up 1.46% to 139. Gemworth Mortgage Insurers was down 8.04% to 206. McGrath was down 4.17% to 23 cents. And Yellow Brick Road was down 17.65% to 7 cents. AFG, the mortgage aggregator, was down 2.79% to 1.74. And Mortgage Choice was down 1.96% to 75 cents. So all those stocks directly related to the property sector are significantly depressed at the moment. The Aussie dollar ended up 1.20 to 63.09. The euro Aussie dollar was down 0.9% to 1.77. And the Aussie gold cross was down 1.11% to 2,505, while the Bitcoin Aussie cross was down 40.42% to 8,439. And overnight, US stocks had staged a fresh plunge pushing the S&P 500 index and Nasdaq Composite into a bear market and officially ending an 11-year long bull run market. And of course, in spectacular fashion, the issues around oil, the virus and the fear of recession all helped to fuel almost indiscriminate selling of assets considered risky and haven assets like bonds and gold alike. The S&P 500 index fell 9.51% to 2,480. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was down 9.99% to 21,200. And that's the worst percentage drop for blue chips since October 1987. Meanwhile, the Nasdaq Composite Index gave up 9.43% to close at 7,201. And on the previous day, the Dow fell into a bear market and the Nasdaq and the SP500 joined the benchmark on Thursday, 
as a drop of at least 20% from a recent record peak is the widely accepted definition of a bear market. Now it's worth saying of course that just three weeks ago the markets were absolutely at their peak and probably very much overextended but nevertheless the fall is worrying. One analyst summed up the situation by saying while there continues to be human tragedy the latest developments also add to investor uncertainty. There is little doubt that there will be a dramatic short-term impact on the economy. The probability of at least one quarter of negative economic growth is high. A key question for longer term investors is, are the economic effects of the virus likely to be like a storm or will it cause permanent damage to the economy? And the truth is, of course, that nobody knows and markets hate that. But central banks were trying to shore up the markets. The US Federal Reserve unveiled $1.5 trillion in fresh liquidity to combat temporary disruptions in funding markets as a part of its $600 billion reserve management purchases for the monthly period beginning March the 13th and continuing through April 13th, 2020. The desk will conduct purchases across a range of maturities to roughly match the maturity composition of Treasury securities outstanding. And today, March the 12th, the desk will offer $500 billion in a three-month repo operation. And it will settle on March 13th. And tomorrow, the desk will offer a further $500 billion in a three-month repo operation and $500 billion in a one-month repo operation for same-day settlement. Three-month and one month repo operations for $500 billion will be offered on a weekly basis for the remainder of the monthly schedule. And the desk will continue to offer at least $175 billion in daily overnight repo operations and at least $45 billion in two week term repo operations. These changes are being made to address highly unusual disruptions in Treasury financing markets associated with the virus outbreak, the Fed said. And in Canada, in order to support the continuous functioning of financial markets through the provision of liquidity, the Bank of Canada announced two measures. First, acting as a fiscal agent, the bank will broaden the scope of the current Government of Canada bond buyback program. This is intended to add market liquidity and support price discovery. Until further notice, buybacks will extend across all benchmark maturity sectors and will be conducted at least weekly. And regular weekly operations will be conducted on a switch basis. Cash buybacks will be conducted following nominal bond auctions. The first operation will be a $500 million switch operation in the 30-year sector held on Monday, March the 16th. And additional program details will be forthcoming, including the timing of the first operation. And second, to proactively support interbank funding, the Bank of Canada will temporarily add new term repo operations with terms of six and 12 months. These operations will occur bi-weekly, starting with the first operation on Tuesday the 17th of March 2020. And European Central Bank Chief Christine Lagarde warned on Thursday that the virus had delivered a major shock to the global economy that required urgent coordinated action as she unveiled fresh stimulus to keep credit flowing. As part of its stimulus package, the ECB's Governing Council agreed a new round of cheap loans to banks known as long-term refinancing operations to provide immediate support to the euro area financial system. At 0.25 percentage points below the rate the ECB charges on bank deposits in Frankfurt, the different represents an effective subsidy to the financial system. And they also ease conditions on existing targeted loans, aiming to support bank lending to those affected most by the spread of the virus, in particular small and medium-sized enterprises. And the ECB will pile an extra 120 billion euros or 135 billion dollars of quantitative easing asset purchases this year on top of its present 20 billion per month. And on top of the monetary measures, the ECB's banking supervisory arm said it would allow banks to run down some of the capital buffers they must build up in the good times to weather crises but it surprised observers by leaving key interest rates unchanged. 
And now the AFR is reporting that the RBA is supporting liquidity in the banking system in Australia. The Reserve Bank of Australia is pumping $8.8 billion into short-term commercial bank funding to ease a squeeze in global credit markets. The emergency move follows a similar intervention by the New York Federal Reserve overnight. The US Treasury market seized up after debt investors were spooked. Local bond market sources reported an evaporation of liquidity, heavy selling pressure, clogged dealer balance sheets and upward pressure on government bond yields in global government bond markets, including the US and Australia. There's heavy selling of bank bill futures, a bit like the global financial crisis, one trader said. So all of this is more evidence of central bankers trying to exercise their liquidity muscles, but the markets were not necessarily impressed. And as I said before, central bankers cannot cure a virus. And Fitch said that fiscal easing will be part of the optimal policy response to economic shocks or downturns, particularly for sovereigns with strong public finances. However, fiscal loosening rarely pays for itself, and persistent deterioration in public finances will increase the risk of sovereign rating downgrades, with sovereign borrowing costs at record lows and monetary policy potentially running out of firepower. Many commentators argue that government should relax fiscal policy to boost GDP growth and can do so safely without putting public debt sustainability sustainability at risk. Now, Fitch tends to use the term fiscal space primarily to denote the room for governments to run larger budget deficits or increase public debt without triggering a rating downgrade. This is a narrower concept than the IMF's the room for undertaking discretionary fiscal policy relating to existing plans without endangering market access and debt stability. And they said all the G7 plus India are among the three weakest sovereigns in terms of public finances in their rating categories. The GDP of three sovereigns with the weakest public finance in each rating category totals 54% of world GDP, while the three strongest in each category total just 5%. So countries where fiscal stimulus could provide a fill up to global growth have less fiscal space available for doing so. And Morgan Stanley states the obvious. For those who have at least been following DFA, the stresses in many areas of the financial markets are spreading. The market is increasingly pricing in a seizing of the real economy as the market awaits more details on the timing and scope of response. Compounding these problems is growing financial stresses as cash becomes dearer, which threatens to create a negative feedback loop between markets and the economy. Poor liquidity, a breakdown in correlations, physical exchanges closing like the CMA for now, and many working from home compound the problem. While a 2008-style financial system meltdown may not be on the cards, the market is increasingly demanding greater liquidity backstops and greater fiscal action. And finally, Damien Boy at Credit Suisse pretty much sums it up. Overnight, the Fed announced it will be increasing its repo size to $1 trillion per month, while the ECB announced more liquidity management asset purchase measures, refraining from cutting rates into more negative territory. Yet despite all of this messaging, bond yields rose into the close and are rising in the Asian time zone. What has caused central bankers to behave the way they have? And why aren't bond yields falling in response to the measures announced? The issues are that the volatility in the bond market is now at very high levels and illiquidity is becoming a major problem. And these factors are causing some highly perverse pricing distortions across the fixed income complex and general upward pressure on bond yields, causing the Fed to consider stepping in. But there are question marks about whether the Fed's balance sheet expansion is the right way to manage illiquidity in the system. Some commentators are suggesting more nuanced measures such as debt buybacks instead. Our issue is that risk parity investors are now pretty much all in on bonds at just the wrong time, when bonds are experiencing the sharpest delta in risk profile of all the major asset classes. In short, anyone who thinks that bonds and related exposures are safe ought to think again. There is no worse place to hide than in bonds right now. We reiterate our view that it is the wrong response from the Fed to try to save risk parity and passive investors because this task is all but impossible. There has been no diversification in these portfolios on the way down, and there is no diversification on the way up. Better to let the losers fall where they lie and pick up the pieces later. Instead, 
what we have is the Fed and other central banks using up all their limited ammunition against a force of nature, undermining their credibility in the process and exacerbating the sell-off in train. Consider this, equities now look cheap relative to bonds both in Australia and in the US. But if bond yields rise, the valuation buffer for equities gets eaten away without necessarily commensurate earnings growth to offset due to the virus shutdown phase. This is not a time to capitulate on risk. It is a time to get bearish on bonds. And the bottom line, therefore, is that all bets are off as the financial crisis continues to rage. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.